in their ruling periods to the people of Afghanistan, particularly, but not only, to the women. But if we look at who the U.S. is backing, these warlords that are suddenly our guys, they're no better. If we look at the history of who began the terrible, uh, what has now become commonplace in some terrible parts of Afghanistan, where women face the danger of having acid thrown in their faces if they dare to go to school, that didn't begin with the Taliban. That began with a great supporter of the United States, one of Pro President Reagan's favorites, uh, a warlord of the time, Gulbadin Hekmatyar, when he was a 17-year-old student and decided on his own. Back in the late 1970s at the University of Kabul, he didn't like women going to school. He invented that tactic. So we have to look at what is really going to make the situation better. For me, looking at the situation of Afghan women, which is such a terrible situation for, for that population, what we're looking at is that after eight, almost nine years of U.S. military occupation, the women of Afghanistan face the highest level of maternal mortality, meaning that more Afghan women die in childbirth than anywhere else in the world. And just a month or so ago, Amy, UNICEF, the UN's Children's Fund, announced that in their new assessment, Afghanistan was now the worst place in the world for a child to be born. It beat out Sierra Leone. The worst place for a child to be born after almost nine years of U.S. occupation and a thousand U.S. troops dead, and how many thousand are terribly injured? The money that we're paying, aside from the human cost, the 30,000 escalation that's now underway is costing about a million dollars per soldier. That same million dollars could cover 20 workers in this country for good green jobs, a $50,000 a year job with benefits and a living wage. What's going to make us safer? A, a war that's antagonizing people consistently, that's creating new terrorists for every time we happen to get the right guy, which is, seems to be about never these days because we're getting civilians instead, or real jobs to build up our economy and provide real aid for the people of Afghanistan. That's the set of considerations we have to look at. There's no silver bullet here. There's no silver peace tactic. There's a whole set of things Phyllis that we're going to have to do. Uh, BBC just reported that Western diplomats have expressed concern about a decree from Afghan President Hamid Karzai granting him total control over a key election body. The move gives him the power to appoint all five members of Afghanistan's Electoral Complaints Commission. Um, this is the watchdog group that helped expose massive fraud in last year's presidential election and forced Karzai into a second vote. Your response? Well, I think we're going to see another massive level of corruption. This is a, a situation in which, under the best of conditions, holding an election under conditions of military occupation means the election cannot be free and fair. Could it be more or less representative of what people believe? Maybe it's possible. But when one party in a completely divided nation, a nation which does not have a history of focusing its legitimacy on a strong central government, but rather has historically provided legitimacy to local officials, local movements, local shuras or councils, collaborations of villages and tribal leaders, women's organizations, all of the various social forces, they have had the power and the legitimacy, not what happens in Kabul. The president, Karzai, is known as the mayor of Kabul for the simple reason that he doesn't have much influence outside of the capital. Phyllis the fact fine. that he's now claiming even additional power, it means it's not going to work. Final question, the anti-war movement. What do you think, and you end your primer, uh, ending the U.S. war in Afghanistan with this, what do you think the anti-war movement needs to do? <clears throat> We need to have a very powerful and very different kind of anti-war movement. We need an anti-war movement that links our work with the powerful new movements that are just beginning to rise in response to the economic crisis in this country and around the world. We need to link our work to the people that are working on the demand for jobs, on people that are demanding climate justice, on people that are demanding health care in this country as well as around the world. The, the wars in Afghanistan and even Iraq, where it continues, are no longer the public centerpiece of White House strategy the way they were during the Bush years. We are part of something much larger now. 
We need an anti-war movement that is, in fact, a component of something much larger, rather than being primarily something that is itself leading that fight back. We're going to have to mobilize in different ways with different allies. The costs of war are going to be key. And I think that's going to be one of the most important shifts that we see in this new anti-war movement, that we work as much with people that are fighting for new green jobs as we do fighting against the travesty of civilian deaths in Afghanistan or Iraq. Phyllis Bennis, I want to thank you very much for being with us. Congratulations on your new book with David Wildman called Ending the U.S. Thanks, war in Afghanistan, a primer. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Back